Yahweh promises to gather everyone he scattered. I am a Hebrew. We are Hebrews. I was born in Texas. I am a Hebrew and I am from Florida. I'm a Hebrew and I was born in California. I am a Hebrew and I was born in San Diego, California. I'm a Hebrew. I was born in Indiana. I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I am a Hebrew and I was born in Spain. I was born in Hebrew. I was born in Spain. I was born in Puerto Rico. I am a Hebrew from West Africa, Liberia. I am a Hebrew, and I was born in a straight way. We are Hebrews. I will make you Shalom, shalom, shalom. Tonight, I need my mother, my mother, and she's not with me. But I got another. I got a sister. Hallelujah. So, I'm your host tonight, Sister Ashley. Mother Jennifer's got the night off. Welcome to... Another weekly show we call Sister to Sister, a conversation that hopefully always edifies. Tonight will be different than ever before, something we've never, ever talked about. Tying in things, of course, that we have talked about. Hallelujah. I have an interviewer, interviewee on the other line. Bless you to everyone listening. All glory and honor to the Most High Yah. Can I get a hallelujah from my audience? Hallelujah. All right. Let's get a sound off. Who's here? Say your name. Tammy, Nadia, Cheyenne, Granny, Amanda, and Sakina, who never speaks. We got it. I left my, right, she says, I just work here. Bless y'all, bless y'all. I hope y'all have uh, had a wonderful week. Hey, I had some really good conversations, you know. Um, gosh, my, well, I, I'm, I always say it, I'm so bl- blank until we go live, and now my, now my mind is rolling, my mind is rolling. Uh, blessed be the Most High, Yah. Uh, I lift him up. I lift him up. We all need healing. 
right? And tonight it's about healing, whether you are, you know, originally called black American or whatever minority you might be from, that's going to be our vein that we speak in tonight. I thank the Most High Yah for gathering each and every one of you. I really do believe in his word. I really do believe that he's gathering. I believe that we are his people. I'm glad to know everybody. I had great conversations this week um, with a lot of sisters, and uh, glad to see growth and, you know, just to know you. Hallelujah. I bless the Most High Yah for his... Um, his grace and favor. Um, he doesn't show favor the way that Christianity taught us, you know. He shows favor by trial and test. He shows favor by uh, imparting more upon you, giving you more. Um, favor is a whole interesting word to meditate on and to really think about how you are in his favor or not. Hallelujah. Tammy's Jack in a pen. That's the most I yeah, like like Elder Becker said on his show one night, he said he took a big drink of water, he goes, Thank you, Jesus, for water. You know? It's like, yes, thank you, Jesus, for water. If your water in your house freezes or get turned off, thank you, Jesus, for water, right? If you've ever been without. The show always goes a little different without my mama, my mother. Hallelujah. So I acknowledge uh Shepherd tonight out. I never called him Shepherd probably until just recently. You know, you hear it so, so, so much. He's just always been a uh, pastor to me. Shepherd was kind of, uh, of course, a biblical term and, you know, came in with some of the brethren and men that um, call him that. So to, to my shepherd, to my pastor, I uh, bless him and his house uh, for the burden and for the joy that they have. Um, definitely comes with, it's, um, if you could say, equality, you know. The burden is equal to the joy. The burden is heavy, hallelujah, but the, the, yoke, is, the yoke is light. It's it's a, a wonderful time to live in. There's a lot of learning going on, a lot of growth, right? Hopefully a lot of deliverance if you need it. Hopefully a lot of seeking the Most High Yah. I thank the Father for, uh, for Deacon Bell. I said to him tonight, as I often do, I had quite a few people over, over at the house. I'm like, Deacon, you mind if I ask you a question that's going to get you preaching? It's just a, it's just a little... A little thing that I say to him because it'll get him fired up and he'll just start, you know, coming from the word or using scriptures or he just becomes, you know, he comes out of himself. And so he's like, yeah, that's all right. He just got home from work too, you know, quiet man. I'm like, hey, everybody that was over there, hey, come on in. Come on in to uh, sit down. And so we're all sitting at the table and... Of course, I asked him a, a really fired up question, and was the first thing you do, Chef? He, take, he took a deep breath, took his jacket off, didn't he? Took, jacket took, right a, off. took his jacket off. Oh, God. Man, you gotta hit that, you know? Gotta hit that. Um, take this phone for a minute. It seems that maybe my husband is needing a verification code. It, it's pulling up. I don't know if it's just iPhone playing around or if my husband's needing something. Yes, so I thank the Father. We had a great um, great fellowship just right even before the show, you know, just talking about the Word, talking about the Father. It's, that's what we do. That's all we live, you know. If you think about being set apart like we are, all the distractions and the the city lights and the noises and uh, even the, the cultural shocks and expressions out in the world, we just don't have that influence, you know. It's just a really set-apart place. It's beautiful. Thank the Father for laying it upon Pastor's heart so many years ago. Um, when I came here, and I'm still giving thanks to the Father, uh, when I came here, I really just, I just wanted to be in the peace that, you know, I have the peace like these people here have, you know, like my, my old shoes. And, uh, yeah, I got it. I got it. I got a peace that passes all understanding. Anything and everything that comes or that even tries to shake it, you still have, what did you say, Granny Diane, a foundation of peace that it just don't go nowhere. It just don't. Uh, you fight hard for that. You fight many, you know, many battles, many experiences, and even many years to get it. And uh, once you fight hard for your peace, you don't, you don't let anything or anyone take it. You really don't. So I pray that that becomes part of your testimony. You got a journey ahead of you. You got some miles to run. But... Hallelujah. May your life be just as peaceful as mine is. So tonight, I'm bringing up Sister Erica Perez. Maybe that's 
some of you very first time hearing her name. Now, in uh, in my introduction, Sister Erica, um, all I know all I knew is from Texas. Um, and you can correct me, Erica, in a moment. All I knew was, all right, you have a mass exodus coming out of Texas. Saints, you know, coming out, getting out of the city, and then you have her husband, who was asked to lead those that were not just left behind in a sense of uh, forgotten, but those who were still stocking up, storing, making moves, doing what you need to do, and then it's like y'all yeah, just was adding people, adding people, adding people, just got bigger, bigger, bigger. Now her husband has the fellowship in his house. That was all that I knew, and. I reached out to Erica even last feast. It was our first time connecting, and I put a huge responsibility on her and trust on her and her team that I had never worked with. This is what I need y'all to do at this upcoming feast. And they got it done. I mean, they got it done, and they got it done every night. And it speaks volumes for leadership and her ability to work with her sisters, her team. So special thank you to everyone there who is, you know, just even following uh, the Messiah through her husband and her, you know, you definitely, when you're put in a position like that, if, if there's a fellowship in your house, you're not, uh, you didn't ask for that, you know, you just have the right, uh, the right home and the right spirit to represent straightway. So I'm bringing her on um, for many different reasons, and I'll save some of those. Erica, let's get a sound check, and let's give some acknowledgments from your heart. Who's Who's on your mind? What would you like to say just to introduce yourself? Shalom, shalom. I'm Sister Erica Perez from Texas. As Sister Ashley said, yes, ma'am. Um, I want to get on here and first and foremost thank the Most High for all He's done because without Him, I'm nothing. For His long, I thank for His long suffering, His mercy, and most importantly, His love. Um, I also want to give thanks and acknowledge my husband, Brother Jonathan, for everything He's done for covering me, for His love He has for the Most High is beautiful. The love that he has for the saints, the sacrifices he makes for his family, and what's needed to be done. Um, I also want to give acknowledgement to Pastor Dow, Pastor Core, all the leadership, all the mothers, the righteous examples before us, doing these examples and giving us the open door to come in and have the righteous examples to follow. Bless you all. Hallelujah. As y'all can tell, she speaks very confidently. Uh, thank you. All right, Deacon you Bell's taken care of. We can move forward. Um, she speaks very confidently. Hey, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna give y'all some important da 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 a, a short drum roll from my audience, please. You guys have went entirely too long before. Thank you, thank you. All right, we got we're we're gonna keep practicing. Y'all gotta bear with us because we gotta get in one line. We gotta start and stop together. It seems to you know the pressure that the microphone brings is really what we need for great practice anyway. Or I would work on them behind the scenes, okay? But sometimes I've had drum rolls that are just like, okay, you know, all right, I'd like to say something now. This is, this is my show. And so, um, Granny Diane's here tonight. Hallelujah. Shout out to Elder Becker. Can everybody say, thank you, Elder Becker. Thank you, Elder Becker. Right. I'm telling y'all, Elder Becker just even answering the phone calls is a huge, um, it's a huge priority for the ministry. Because it's going to establish the character of those who come in. That's a huge responsibility. Because you're going to have so many type of personalities and characters try to come in, get in. And you want the righteous, you know. And then you also want those who are <clears throat> just hungry, you know. And so we bank on his discernment and the many, many phone calls that he takes. But thank you, Elder Becker, all the way from Canada, from North Carolina. Hallelujah. Rolling in. Yep, rolling in, Sister Chris. Thank you, Elder Becker, and bless you, Granny. Hallelujah. All right, y'all. I got a couple different uh, announcements that are important. You guys are going to want to know. If you're coming to Passover, you're going to want to know this. And I have some emails that I want to pull up. I'm going to do that right now. I told you when my mother's not here, I often have to, I have to be the filler, you know. So, real quick, count down two months and four days. Two months and four days. And we're going to see some of you. That's really short, right? Two months and four days. I try to be done with the uh, homeschool by then. 
I'm two weeks behind right now. I'm I'm busting it, but I'm two weeks behind. Um, if you're coming to the feast, and this is at, at least to the best of my knowledge, to any sisters, this is the first communication that you're going to hear about the date. Your arrival that you're allowed and permitted to come set up and be on this land is uh, April 11th, okay? April 11th, our land is open to you guys, and we're going to feed you. So that's two months and no days, right? That's a Monday. That's a second day. That is the 11th of April, okay? Now, that's your arrival. You got to let us know your departure. If you're going to stay all the way through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you got to let us know, okay? Feast of Unleavened Bread ends on the 21st of April, okay? So you have from 11th, that is, the land is open, and then I'm at least just giving you the Unleavened Bread date, okay? I'm not, get, I'm not announcing a cutoff. I'm just giving you the end date there. And so... Here's another very important one. If you have this dialogue amongst anybody, let them know to call by April the 1st. Now, last year, Pastor had given a cutoff, and it does help us um, with the numbers and the logistics of planning. It helps greatly to have that cutoff because a lot of calls would come in really, really last minute. And, uh, you know, you have to shuffle your numbers and how much you're making and things like that. So if you call in by April 1st, that means... Calling after that is no guarantee at all. And last year, we had an entire list of names that didn't call on time. Some not knowingly, some accidentally, some forgetting. But I wouldn't want any of you to end up on that. Especially, even if you live off land, if you live around us, you please call, let us know, or write your name in our books. You know where our book is, Down the Hill, by April 1st. And the last and final very important Remember This announcement is Letters or requests for your time off from work, if you want time off or if you need time off from work, if you need time off from your school, your college, or whatever letter of approval that you may need from our shepherd, you have to turn that request in by March the 7th. Okay, he's going to be done, right? Done by March the 7th. So get it in. Now that you know the dates that you can come, now you can lock down some dates, hopefully save some, you know, penny pinch on your our last few paychecks. Blessed be the most high, yeah. All right, so count down again, two months, four days. Your arrivals can start as early as April 11th. You call us by April the 1st, right? That's that's only 11-day difference. Sometimes that can that can be 50 to 50, I mean 50 to 75 people. Letters for your time off from work or school, turn it in by March the 7th, okay? All right. And we'll love to feed you. I know it'll be a big weekend for sure. So we definitely just want to know who's going to stay through Unleavened Bread. That's what we need to know. Yes, so Holy Days calendar. Never forget it. i got to show you all this um Thank you, Erica, for being so patient and waiting on me. She doesn't mind at all. i got to I gotta read an article to you guys. Brother Ugly sending the crying emoji in the chat. Bless you, Brother Ugly. Yes. Um, what did you say? Announcement? What did you say? Holy Days Calendar. Yes, Holy Days Calendar. I went over to the chat to see if it was typed in, but HolyDaysCalendar.com, right? Yes. HolyDaysCalendar.com. Get it. It's already February. Get you. Uh, I'm looking at February. It's got a really, really cool turtle. With a verse on it that says, Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me. Unleavened bread, the feast of harvest, the feast of tabernacles. Yes. Speaking to the men, we have seven feasts. You can find them in Leviticus 23. If you want to know more about us, I hope you're following us week to week to find out who we are. Definitely, definitely judge us by our fruits. Our life is an open book for you. Check this out, y'all. So... Maybe you've heard it before because it's been in the works for a few years. There are robots and artificial intelligence being involved to optimize the generation of a human life. So you have science that's saying, let's develop a newborn inside of a tank, right? 
Because in China, this is true, infants are fed in these tanks as if they're in the real womb in an artificial optimized mix of nutritious fluids that they believe will be a long-term embryo culture device. Okay, they're doing it for animals. They want to do it for humans. That means if I take your baby out at two weeks gestation and I place it in this tank, you can clearly see through it and watch your baby develop and grow, and it will cut down on the amount of premature labor, and it will also cut down on the uncomfortableness of having a child. You know, the morning sickness, the throwing up, the blood pressure, the right, the swollen feet, whatever you might get. You won't have that with this embryo device. Is that not satanic? I had to share that. I had to share that. Now, to even see the, the pictures of it was incredible. So, it says, for example, producing children within people is lengthy, drawn out, it says here on the article, unpleasant. and could potentially aid mothers who would like to have their children from a surrogate. Right? Wow. They're just thinking of everything they can. Very similar. Yes, they liken it, Amara, to the Matrix. Yes, she says it is. Incredible. So, yes, the little, they call it nanny tank, being created by Chinese scientists to grow babies in robot wombs. Robot wombs. Wow. All right. What else? What else are they going to do? Hey, guess what? I'm going to build the show, Erica. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Why would I have Erica Perez on here? Many, many, many different reasons. I do, um, I really do admire Yah in you. I really always have. Um, you know, you see those, mm-hmm. hallelujah, you see those um, those type of women and they stand out. And, um, yeah, I just, I, I want to, number one, I want to honor that, you know. Number two, I want to talk a little bit about race because uh, tell everybody what your ethnic classification is according to America. I would be considered Mexican Hispanic. All right, should be considered Mexican Hispanic. I have zero, and and I'm a I'm a white considered Caucasian white woman according to America. Uh, I have zero mm-hmm. zero relationships. I didn't know any. I wasn't around any Hispanics at all. My first. Um, relationships with them are here in the faith. So I believe I I have a very um, limited knowledge. Um, My life was very, if I can say, black or white, and I just didn't have any opportunities. And so I also wanted to honor, if if we can use the word race, let me explain, okay? So speaking to people out there who understand race, but within our tribe, within Israel, race is, is different. Okay, so I do. I want to. I want to just build everybody by saying tonight we want to focus on identity development and how we see ourselves. Okay, because y'all know we come from, or this country was originally with colonizers who had a. They had their own cultural conditioning, and they had their own domination, and they were the ones that saw indigenous people as culturally deficient. They were the ones who said blacks are inferior, Hispanics inferior. You know, they were the ones who built this structure. Exploitation came first. We know that. Exploitation came first. And then the ideology of unequal races to justify the exploitation. You know, to justify why we need you to build this, make this, do this, work this field. And America has become a very racially divided country, has always been. But we're different in Israel. We're different. And so I kind of just want, I want to hear from her a lot tonight, but follow me for a minute. So slavery, segregation, mass incarceration, these things produced racist ideas of black people. 
that, hey, black people are best suited and they, they deserve slavery, segregation, jail cells, right? And sometimes when you consider racism, it tends to be white, black, black, white, white, black, black, white, you know? And I've just never heard that Hispanic voice. I personally haven't. Call me, call me shallow. But consumers of these racist ideas that blacks need to be confined to slavery, they need to be confined to segregation or jail cells, that also led to believe that something's very wrong with minority peoples. And sometimes, like I always say about every show, I have no idea why we're talking about it. But I know we need to obey the the leading. We need to go this way. I know that's what we need to do. Somebody's going to um, get healed, you know, or begin their journey of healing. That's what it's about. You're going to hear healing in Erica's voice. And so race is this evolving social idea that was to protect white advantage. We know that. And an interesting couple of facts, y'all don't get bored by my numbers, that the term white didn't even originate till 1600, okay? And fast forward 200 years later, 1800, people were asked to actually claim their race on a census, which is why I can say, hey, Erica, what's your ethnic classification according to America, right? Because that started in 1790. Now, by 1825, just 50 years later or so, then here comes the Native Americans that need to be classified by their blood. If y'all heard those stories, right? So when slavery in the United States was abolished in 1865, that's us saying, hey, it's no longer going to exist. Does anybody believe that? No. All it's going to do is just take legalized racism off the books. But it's going to continue violence against African Americans and minorities. It's going to just hide a little bit, you know. So to have citizenship in 1865, if you wanted to be a citizen, because guess what? Now we've abolished slavery, and now if you want to be a citizen, we're going to, you know, make things illegal, and then we're going to make you make you and you and you a citizen. You had to be legally classified as white. So people with non-white racial classifications, Hispanic, which they wouldn't have maybe said Hispanic at the time, or Mexican, or Negroid, these had to be classified as something else, you know. So it causes this uproar, and everybody says, "Well, let's let's re reclassify me. Give me an opportunity in a white world, right? Because just deleting something off the books never made a difference." But this is America, though, y'all. This is America. Go with me. So, Arameans, for example, they were reclassified as white. Because science said, eh, you got white skin, you look Caucasian. And so this skin color issue became a reason to live, a reason to you could do this or not do that. It was still a push. In 1922, Supreme Court says, and this is 1922, y'all. What is this, 2022? 100 years ago. That's actually not too long. 100 years ago, Supreme Court says, hey, Japanese, you're not going to be legally white anymore. We're going to change you to mongoloid because that's what you are scientifically, you know. So the people, the, the structure of this country started to do these things. So in other words, people already saw white, or how do I say it? People that were already white were deciding who can be white with them, you know. And so it's it's really it's really twisted and there's European ethnic groups like you got Irish, what about Italian? What about the Polish? Hey, don't they you know, similar skin color, different dialect. But this racial identification became literally fundamental in your identity development and the way that we see each other in this country. And that's the onslaught and the initial social force that was manifested so many years ago. And I marvel because when you come here, when you come to Straightway, there is no, um, like, racism protection or um, prejudice 
prejudgment. Why? How can we come from the world and there is none, right? Maybe it's still under the radar in some hearts based on what you've done or what your family's went through, so I don't want to remove that idea. But at the same time, there's such healing here because of the men that lead us that don't base anything on a stereotype or a generalization of this is this group of people. You can only be an elder if, you know, you can only be a head of a community if, you can only come to the community if, right? Y'all see any of that? No. Nope. Nope, shaking heads. Audience is shaking heads. So we kind of step away from the mold big time when um, when you get here, and you can heal. You can heal in an environment like that, right? And so discrimination, remember discrimination has potentially happened to some of you. Racism, backed by legal authority and institutional control, has potentially happened to you. Hatred, emotions. You know, uh, and now you, you're seeing uh, at least enough freedom on the streets for the, can I say, black American to even project his violence and his discrimination against the white American, you know, the colonizers, et cetera. So there's a huge um, structural racist spirit created in our society. And... Check it out. Structures of oppression go well beyond just individuals, and that's often forgotten. So if there is racism or structures of oppression, it's not just one person. It never is, you know. That's why one person can come out of that matrix and another one and another one and another one. That's how you can see the bond and the love and the true brotherhood and sister sisters that are growing here. Okay, so building that idea of race. I'm jumping to Sister Erica, and I'm going to ask you, and, you know, as we build a relationship, Erica and I, too, and me going, yo, I've seen this woman just a couple of times, spoke to her maybe ten times at the most, um, seeing growth, you know, hearing confidence from a, what the world classifies, a minority woman. This is a woman that's overcome much. So I just wanted to hear her perspective. Y'all want to hear it? Yes. yes. Cool. Everybody cool? So, yeah, that's why that's why the show will be different because I have um, one, two, three, four, five, five other women. Uh, let's see. One Puerto Rican. One Mexican. I'm reading the questionnaires that I sent them before tonight's show. One, uh, another Puerto Rican. One Hispanic, Florida. One uh, Hispanic or Dominican in Cuba. All right, so with this, um, what I have is these questionnaires, and I have their communication to me because they they answered the questions that I sent them. And then you have Erica, who's going to, based on her experience, talk more and elaborate more. So we're going to start in the natural, okay, just to build a story, get you guys to relate. Hopefully there's somebody out there that is, um, you know, going to really be touched. And... Number two, I do remember this, give much honor to the Hispanic people who are also y'all, y'all's called out people. Y'all agree? Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, Hebrew, yes. Some by blood, yes. Um, so I want to honor that and just and just hear her voice tonight. So y'all bear with me. This is how it's going to be. This is going to be the conversation. It's what it's about. So um, one of the questions that I ask, of course, I ask a lot of these um, people where they were from, uh, Sister Erica, and there's a lot. Yeah, what you got? Uh, questions? Ah, interesting new fact. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll put that in, put that in. Um, gosh, I've always been so intrigued by other people, even in in my uh, prior to the faith, other people, listening to them, um, watching their documentaries, if I can say traveling the world through a documentary, which is, of course, can be very shaded or shallow. But I have people now, and these questionnaires even in front of me, where, hey, you grew up in Puerto Rico, really? Or you were born there? And you in Cuba? You in Dominican Republic? This is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is, this is marvelous in y'all's eyes. Like, look at this gathering, right? So I ask them, you know, where's your father and your mother from? And a lot of them were born out of country. Tell me about your uh, father or mother. Where were they born? 
Yes, ma'am. My father was born in a city in Mexico called Guanajuato. Uh, my mother was born and raised here in Texas. In Texas, hallelujah. And so, as you said earlier, you were um, Mexican or Hispanic. Sister um, Sakina just passed me a note that said the word Hispanic was actually adopted by the U.S. government in 1970. I'm like, wow. See, so you were even given a title just mm-hmm. even coming here. Um, do you have any thoughts before I kick off my conversation? I don't want to overpower uh, your voice tonight. No, ma'am. I'm just going. Um from your direction and okay. give my input here on yes ma'am awesome all right great so we'll do the interview style and we'll roll with it um a lot of these had the exact same uh religion okay so my sisters who i asked were either pentecostal christian with a catholic mix pentecostal christian catholic mix so tell me tell me what yours was i was pentecostal pentecostal what was Pentecostal? Yes, what did that, what did that mean? Pentecostal, you know, we were very traditional. There's different types of Pentecostal, from my understanding. The Pentecostal that I grew up was pretty much old fashioned. You know, we pretty, um, we, you know, we didn't wear pants. We wore skirts. We never cut our hair. Very old school, I would say, but had Christian doctrine as well put into it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm noticing that blend here with everyone. So I also notice a pattern in each individual response. And thank you, Mama Nelly. I'm going to shout out your name because she's in here, y'all. Um, there was an issue with speaking English. I, let me say it like this. There wasn't an issue speaking English, I should say. It was almost like it was either promoted English only at school, one said. One father preferred speak English only um, as he got older. It's almost like hiding it. One said, um, of course, she grew up over over in another country, so she, she could speak both. But I see the pattern of hiding hiding the English language or hiding the Spanish language even. Speak Spanish and almost pretend you don't know English or save the English for the right time. What was your experience like? So growing up, my father only knew Spanish, and growing up, he would speak to us in Spanish, but we had to respond in English. He didn't want us responding in Spanish. He wanted us to stay with our, what you would say, um, our first language, which was English. He didn't want us to speak that um, Spanish language because that could look, people could cause people to look down on us. Yes. Uh, Can you speak more to that? What, What was that like? For him, his heart, what did he mean? So my father grew up as an orphanage. You know, he grew up a hard life in Mexico. You know, he was considered what, you know, here Americans would call an uh, legal immigrant. So he came here. He was always looked down. He didn't want us to suffer. He didn't want us to go through what he went through. He wanted us to not have that Mexican accent. He didn't want us to be differentiated from others. He wanted us to fit in, to be accepted, and not be looked down or have any kind of racism because he didn't want us to feel the hurt that he felt. And that's amazing. That speaks a lot of volumes for what he even discerned in his country, coming from, you know, his land to this one. He can automatically pick up that this is how we need to do. You know, you have to mold your family to even maneuver into the structure of racism almost. Now, you had said earlier when we spoke that, um, you didn't know for a long time there was any difference in you, right? What was your what was your education and your school experience like? Why did you think or believe you were white? Yeah, I honestly didn't realize I didn't see any difference. I didn't experience racism as a young young age. You know, we try to what you would call keep up with the Jones in the area we lived in. My dad moved us to a city that was um, a high class city, uh, predominant white. You would say um, I was honestly maybe one out of three Hispanics in the school that I grew up in. So I did everything what the whites would. It was all about our reputation. We had to keep up with the reputation. Y'all hear it, right? It's very interesting because it starts to mold you. It starts to really shape you. And almost, even though you couldn't discern it at that age, it creates an inferiority, which we're going to get into later, even with skin color. And so 
when I read here, a lot of families believed in eating a lot of traditional meals and a lot of swine. It seemed to be the the Christmas pork, the swine at every party, the unclean foods like uh, tamales and uh, what's he say? Uh, Shasharon. Am I saying it right? You know. Thank you. Come, come. No, 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 no. Don't, don't come, come. You say it, Erica. What is, what is that word? Yes, Shasharon is. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. So, talk to me a little bit about um, the food, the tradition. What what was that your experience like? Oh, it was very, it was a very big tradition when it came to food for uh, Mexicans. You know, especially for gatherings, for parties, for holidays. You know, we went all out. We did the ham on Thanksgiving, the ham on you know Christmas. We did the tamales. We did the pork tamales. We did the what you would call like carnitas tacos. You know, everything had to do with swine. It was in there. There was never a meal without, whether it be, you know, traditional bacon, sausage, everything, cookouts. It was always involved in the meal. Wow. Uh, one one uh, sister here said, you know, for every decoration party, there was swine. For every get-together, there was swine. Thanksgiving had yes. swine, but it had a turkey, too, you know. Um, and, and it really was a lot of tradition, steeped in a lot of traditions. I noticed the pattern, though, of my questionnaires. And you tell me from your from your view, there was a lot of traditional um the father leads the home. The father was the patriarch, or at least the father uh, the mother stayed home, you know, or the mother was the one that taught the children or taught them how to cook. So, um, you know, and the and the dad was the provider. Was that was that your case? Yes, ma'am. I grew up, you know, with my father always working. My dad was Never home. I was always at home either with my mother, with my grandma, in the kitchen, cooking, learning how to, you know, one day be a mother and take care of the home. Okay. One one sister here says the women work at home. They take care of the children. Um, they would teach their daughters everything that they needed. They needed. She also spent her life or, or a majority of it out of country. So not only just classified in America as Hispanic, but living in the Dominican Republic or in, in Cuba, the so the woman works at home, takes care of the children, teaches her daughter everything from good wife, cooking, cleaning, sewing, crocheting. She always saw her mother taking care of everything before her dad came home from work so the house was peaceful, the house was clean, the dinner was ready. And this example here, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, she says, um, which she appreciated. The father's side was different. Okay, so he had a different angle, but the tradition seemed to be the, the same, that they were very family-oriented. Um, maybe that came from having to stick together. I don't know. Um, what's, what's your view on the family, family traditions and, and how, how tight-knit Hispanic people are? Oh, yes, ma'am. It was very important. You, from what I remember, you would never see a Hispanic family with, you know, separated family. Growing up, there was always – there was always a mom and dad. There was never, you know, a family without a father figure or a mother figure. There was always, it was what you would call a mother, father, you know, family traditions, family gatherings. Everything was done in a family unit. There was no separation like, oh, dad, dad's not included, mom's not included. No, everything was done together. And uh, what did you, what's the, what's the Mexican word for birthdays? Or Spanish word for birthday. Yes, that. So big family yes, gatherings on Sundays, big deals, big deals. Going to grandma's house. Um, I'm seeing that pattern, and that is a beautiful thing, actually. So let's jump mm-hmm. to uh, traditional gender roles, patriarch. She says, going from. Um, oh, it, it's funny how the pork it comes up so 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 much. Okay. So my question was to them, are there any stereotypical classifications about your race that you believe are true? One sister says, I believe one stereotype stereotype of the Hispanic people that they are very sensual, okay? So she said that they were very exposing, dressed very tight, uh, high heels, cleavage was normal, you know, very vain, having to look good, hair, makeup, dress, uh, lots of traditional music and dancing, lots of over-the-top you know, sensual behavior. Um, Hispanic women can be good domestic women, but the men could be very promiscuous. 
the men and women both could be very jealous, very possessive of each other. This was her experience, and this is her family. This is what she grew up in. The men could be very hard workers, or they could be very lazy, no middle ground. Now, she grew up in southern region of Florida, right, where a lot of different Hispanics live. So that's what she saw. Um, hold on before I go to you. So you see the the man coming out of the house in her in her example. You know, this is years later, and the man's coming out of the house, and he's being more possessive. Now, this woman says, uh, women are taught at young age, yes, to cook and clean, be at home. Uh, some are not that way, and they enjoy the party life, and they enjoy being promiscuous. Okay, so they became just as Western as others. Um I think I'll go to you now. I'm not going to go that far with hers. So what what was your experience like? Mine was more, you know, the stereotypical classifications that I know was, you know, we were huge families. We were starting early. You know, we got married, you know, had babies early at teenage age. Um, also, you know, we always were the ones that the stereotypical were, you know, we always did the work that nobody wanted to do. The Mexicans were always working. They packed up in homes. And the majority of them were immigrants. Wow. And, and uh, even in this, it says uh, the women were treated as homemakers. Women were commanded to obey their husband. And their role was to take mm -hmm. care of the children at home. They were portrayed as dependent on their husbands. And this says that they were and still are in this generation portrayed as oppressed. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? And do, does that sound like something you're familiar with? Yes, ma'am, I agree. That was exactly what I was very familiar with. Wow. Okay, so was racism an issue in your childhood home, my sister? From what I can remember, it wasn't. I didn't, um, racism wasn't really much until I, as I got older. I didn't see it as much in my home as a child until middle school, high school age. That's when I really witnessed it. And so when you witnessed it, like statements, uh, better not bring a black man home, right, things like that, did you hear that? Yes, and what was that like? Oh, yes. I heard that all the time growing up, especially it was from my mother. My mother would always tell me, you know, when you get married, you know, uh, make sure you don't bring, uh, what they would say, a black man home because, you know, your life is going to be go down. You're not going to be successful. Your children are going to suffer. You're going to suffer. And they're not going to work, and you're going to be the one, you know, holding this. all that. That's what I was told growing up. So you're going to suffer because they suffer, and basically because of her experience, right? Whoever she had seen yes, or whatever. Her, yes. And so tell me, with uh, tell everyone what, what your husband's ethnic classification is. So my husband is half Mexican and half black, you would say. All right. Let's get that out there. Um, yes, ma'am. This sister says, I did not know racism until I was a teenager in the United States, okay? That seems to be across the board, uh, those who lived out of country and came here. That was that was the answer. She said, the school that I was in was predominant minorities, okay, so just a, a big melting pot of minorities. I did not feel any rejection except from the very few light-skinned Hispanic or Caucasians that looked down at her. And then, boom, she's got different hair, right? So she's light-skinned, but she's got different hair, so they're going to come down on her. Um, another one says, where I grew up, um, all people know color. I mean, it was a blend. She says, when I moved to the United States, people were black or white, and I could not understand. I had grown up with black and white cousins. When I moved here, they told me to be careful with blacks here. So that's interesting. You see the same pattern, right, from what your mother told you. To what here now I was raised in this county and it was the same thing it was let somebody else do it you know you don't bring them home let somebody else do it and or you could marry them why am I saying these things because guess what y'all you might be surprised at what pricks you when you're listening and pricks mm -hmm. usually mean you need healing and so it's like, do you really as a woman love who you are? Do I mean, how much, you know, has been poured into your mind that is contrary from the truth, a biasness, a racial structural pattern, you know, that we've all been 
tainted by. Do you love who you are? And do you identify with who you are the way Yah sees you without these bias, right? This one says they had come up with a comedy named What's Up USA. And this comedy was about two Cuban friends who moved to the United States. One day white friends talking really bad about black people. And the black friend says, come on, brother, I'm black. And the white brother says, no, you're not, you're Cuban. That's kind of humorous, right? You got black skin, but now you're Cuban. So you're really just talking about black Americans, right? So it gets really, it gets really interesting and confusing. Okay, so let me jump to another one. Uh, let's see. She says, "Go go my last one. No. So basically the answer is no. There was not a lot of uh, where she was from. There was no racism, no expression. And, of course, it's always been in the United States. Uh, you tell me more about how you were told or because you're Mexican, what would happen if you married outside of your race? How would you be looked at? I would be looked at, you know, as a dirty person, not amount to anything. Uh, my mom grew up in a neighborhood, which is funny, she grew up with my husband's family. Um, it was one street black and one street Mexicans, you know, she would see the way they suffer. So she would tell me, you know, you don't want to marry, you don't want to bring home a black man. You don't want to get married to one because you will suffer your, you know, even down to the texture of their hair. She mentioned, you know, she would say you get nowhere. They're looked down on. They are not successful. They can't get far. And you at least can get a little bit further than what you would, you know, the black people, she would say, because you're a Mexican. And and this is a very, uh, you know, a very confusing experience for you because you go from a small child, but, you know, not even seeing a difference, believing almost that, you know, you're just like, you know, the white people that you see. Now you're married at a, at a really young age. You're married at 16, and now you're pregnant, right? You marry outside your race, which goes outside what mm-hmm. you've been, you know, taught. And then, okay, your husband's mixed with Hispanic and black. Then you move out of your dad's house. You move immediately into your husband's house, hallelujah, and then um, you're looked at differently as almost a disgrace because, one, okay, you're young and you're pregnant. Two, he's got low color, and your family and friends told you life was over, right? What was that like? Yes, that was a very um, shocking reality to me when I got pregnant at a young age. I was 16. I was still in school. I was a junior in school, actually, you know, and as soon as I got pregnant, as soon as everybody found out, I got married, I immediately saw the change. You know, the racism came at me. Um, I wasn't successful. I was going to have a, you know, they would say, oh, you're having a government baby. You're always going to be on the government. You know, you're not going to graduate. You're not going to succeed. You know, you're going to be with, you know, gangs, and you're going to be around violence. You're going to suffer. It was it was a, re- a reality shock to me when I came into that because I saw what my husband and, you know, his family went through. And when I got a little taste of it, it woke me up. Absolutely. Um, one sister here says she never felt like she could boast in being Puerto Rican. She had honestly felt like it would be in vain because she believed that most would still consider her father as a black man because of his skin tone. And being born in the States, her Spanish wasn't as fluent anymore. And her dad had discouraged it at that point. So there was always this, it's like, it's like the psalm coming alive. You know, we're going to take this away from you. Your tradition, your language, your everything. And how did they do it? By by the society push and by your own families and traditions. You know, they're the ones that really were trying to fit in. And so the Spanish wasn't fluent anymore. And now she's like, man, who wants to perform Puerto Rican customs, Right. So she didn't feel even Puerto Rican enough, right? And so I bring this up because all you're, all you're building with all these young girls is a bunch of insecurity, you know, like the woman who goes, and she was young at the time, she's going to a school that's mainly all Hispanic, but just because you've got a few Caucasians looking down, right, and some light-skinned Hispanics looking down. Why? Because you've got big curly hair, right? Hey, you're healed now. It's, it's just it's worth a big smile, but at the time it's painful. It's painful. So you're starting to, at that time, you're starting to be humbled by the experience of joining yourself with a, you know, 
a Hebrew man or someone of a, a darker hue, you know, considered out of your class and out of your color. All right, so let's walk it on up to did you have any insecurities growing up concerning your race or your culture or why? That's what I ask you. And you had said, yes, I did. My father wanted the best for us since uh, we had a hard life. We had lived in a very successful area. We, wor we worked very hard to have a good life, so to the point that I didn't want to claim that I was even Mexican. And um, what was that like? Was there any pain attached to that, or was it easy? It was easy because that's all I knew. You know, it was very, when I was in school, you know, I would see nothing but, you know, white. And then when a Mexican would, come, Mexican would come along or they wanted me to, like, translate or anything like that, I immediately built up a wall. And I'm like, wait, why are you asking me? You know, I'm not one of them. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, so you wanted to keep up with the people that you went to school with because you have that um, social pressure like a lot of people did. Now, um, she says here, she answers a question, uh, one of the sisters that replies to me, were there any encounters or experiences with racism or prejudice? She says, um, it was really hard at the beginning when she was first encountering it because black blacks didn't like you because you were lighter and white didn't like you because you weren't black. Right, Sakina? That sounds so she started to tell them, you must be jealous of my skin color, right? So this was a woman that was trying to, or she was young at the time, trying to speak back. You know, you see this color, right? But she understood at an early age, y'all loved her. And she would even say, y'all loves me more because I'm tan. You know, I'm not white or black. You blended me, you know, which is kind of cute. So it just depends on where, what, what, how much rejection you really embraced. And, you know, one woman says, no, you know, as a young child or a woman, she didn't deal with any prejudice against her. Um, let me go to this one. I wanted to answer if there was any insecurities growing up. Uh, yes, this one says I was insecure about skin color and my hair. All right, this is because even in the Hispanic culture, lighter skin and straight hair is still more beautiful and accepted, just like in America, All right? Still uh, more beautiful. Um, let's see, this one says, I think I got them all, because this one said no. All right, so to you, Erica, was there a time that you rejected your own skin color and why? I never rejected my skin color because I was accepted, because my skin color was a very light skin. I wasn't dark toned. I was a light skin Hispanic. So I really didn't receive a lot of judgment on that. I really didn't receive a lot of racism towards my skin color, but I did see it, but I embraced it. That's one thing I did do was embrace it, because I loved, that's one thing I was always taught growing up, love your skin color, love who you are, but don't keep it and don't show it. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Um, so a lot of these uh, reply that there was some form of modesty standard in, in their culture of how women were uh, treated, portrayed, or even dressed. But then on the flip side, the women rebelled a lot and were promiscuous and haughty in their nature. Um, what were you taught about your body? To respect it. You know, growing up, my my dad always told me to respect, you know, when when we came into a wom uh, womanhood, when we got our, you know, menstrual at that time, you know, it was very respected. He took care of us. He took over our body, you know, to guard it, whether it be, you know, keep our virginity. Don't, you know, go out in the world because you're going to shame your home. You're going to shame your dad. So that was very taught to me. Very good because that's why you also um, – got pregnant and stayed with the man to this very day from 16 and up. So hallelujah for that. Now, I let, let's go back to this for, for a second because maybe somebody's very new to even hearing the idea of racism being talked about between uh, you got a Hispanic being interviewed by a white and you got a couple black people behind me. Uh, you, got, you got some mix behind me, right? Uh, you got a white woman behind me. And so we're all actually able to maturely dialogue about this and there's just, what's that? Oh, Granny's gone. My, my white woman's gone. I'm the only one here. I'm the only one. I'm the minority, you see. We can joke. We can, right. We can joke. But all jokes aside, really, though, all jokes aside, the freedom, the freedom from, um, how would you say, social oppression actually gives me a level of racial relaxation. 
Y'all know that, right? And it gives you a level of emotional and intellectual space that people of hue don't have. They're not afforded. They can't move around that same way. And when I was introduced into, you know, another world, another, it's always going to be another culture and another hue people, darker skinned people that's going to introduce you into more than what your shallow white world afforded you. We, I personally have always made it a point to become interested in the emotions and the intellect and the, and the, gosh, and the, and the other people, you know? And I think, I think that will remove white supremacy from you mentally when you say, okay, I'm free to move in virtually any space in, in this entire United States, right? I can go in and out. It's normal. It's neutral. It's valuable. Okay, maybe not the Black Panther Party, right? So those are easy to avoid, you know? So let's be honest. I might not have to worry about my class status. I don't got to worry about any kind of setting. I don't got to worry about should I go in there, should I avoid that, like at all. So there's a defense mechanism that is built up in the in the hued mind, the melanated mind, that the white mind is free of. So that's what I mean by I have an emotional and an intellectual space that people of color don't have. And I don't think any of us being white should gloat in that or even live in it or absorb it because it can become a part of your superiority. You know, it can become very offensive, actually, because I'm meaning in the face. So, you know, your race I say race, as in, you know, what they use in America, but your race can work in your favor if you're white. Right? Right. Yeah, it's probably not even easy to hear, is it? Well, it's true. I know. It's true. Everybody's just saying, it's the truth. It's the truth. Yeah, it is what it is. And so um, I, I think just me saying that in the air goes, oh, like they do know, you know, they do know the truth, like, I can't help it. What what did you say before the show? Uh, can I eat the open and change his spots? You know, I mean, can I eat the open and change his skin color? Can a can a leopard change his spots? Um, Erica had said that verse. You referred to that verse before the show, but I definitely don't want to be, you know, just this white person out there that is that touts that freedom. You know what I mean? And and I I don't know if anyone anyone at all in the faith. In my in Abraham's faith, right here at this ministry, that is that practices superiority. But I do think that it's worth reflecting. You know what actual culture and ideas molded you, and what sort of level of racial relaxation you have. You know, like where is your mind at? That's all I'm saying. Erica, do you have thoughts? No, ma'am. Cool. Okay. All right. Good interview, right, y'all? Yeah, everybody's enjoying it. It's very different. Hey, let's hear a song. Be right back. Um, Hallelujah. Erica, you can mute your phone if you need to. Be right back, right back. I think y'all like this. When the road is long and heavy, when it's dark and I can't see that Right. 
sister Ashley here, the host of tonight's show. Mother Jennifer's not here. I got Erica Perez in Texas. Erica, what part of Texas are you in? I'm in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. How many people are in your weekly Shabbat fellowship on your large weekends? Anywhere from 45 to 60 people. 45 to 60 people in your living room? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> how many? Uh, how many? His- ah, yes. How many Hispanics? And remember, we don't classify in Israel. We just don't. We don't see it that way. But um, speaking from the mass amount of people that y'all is gathering, what does it look like? What's the? Uh, does it look like the Passover picture on our website? Yes, ma'am. We. I would say about ten Hispanics. You know. In the Dallas area, yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. And so, shout out to all of y'all. Double honor to you tonight because you are the people of the book. Yeah. Yes. You, you're not mm-hmm. dead. Come on. Absolutely. <laughs> I want anyone to feel inferior here and just like I was saying earlier with um you know even being white and having the um so called power to you know pastor pastor learn strategy living in the in the country and knowing who to send at I'll just say it like that who to send and what face to send to talk to who needed to be talked to as we maneuver in this society. And I've actually um, heard people before say um, that they were, you know, they were nervous getting off the plane, coming here, thinking, like, this is a place, like, they've never even had experience in. This is the South. You've seen the videos that racism is still alive here. If I go with my uh, classified black American husband out somewhere, then, then I've left my people you know, according to them. Um, But anyway, tonight, yeah, we're talking about identity development, right? Your identity development, we all got it. We all got it, whether it's shallow or it's a a melting pot of a lot of different ideas. So how we see ourselves um, generally comes from a lot of these ideas. You know, I never knew my father was racist. I never knew that. My mother told me when he was dead. My mother told me when we came to a a black man's, church, St. Pastor Charles Dow. I said, man, I never knew. I never knew. She said, if your father was alive, he'd have never allowed you to come here. So, wow. I, I'm not so sure that I would have listened. I don't know. You know, I obeyed my father in everything, but not not for my soul. All right, so let's go back to the questionnaires. Let's kick off our part, part two, or can I just say um, part B, and finish off our talk tonight. So, what about the white Jesus, the face of the white Jesus? Um, I'm going to go to my question. What did I say here? Was there was Jesus white to you at one time? I mean, did you believe that lie, and was there any insecurity about that, Sister Erica? Yes, ma'am. I truly believe that Jesus was white. I really did. You know, Mexicans, you know, we're really influenced by the European Catholicism. You know, growing up Mexican, we were taught something, um, and that's what it was. You know, if my grandma or my mother told me, Jesus is white, this is how Jesus looked. You know, we had frames. Um, they even had idols of the, you know, Virgin Mary with Jesus, and he was white. You know, there was a thing during Christmas time, you know, on my dad's side who was Catholic, they would walk the streets of Mexico and go house to house and kiss the, an idol of a ba- what they would say was baby Jesus and leave sacrifices. And all the time, those idols, those baby Jesus, was always white. Yes, lots of idolatry, too. Is that is that a stereotype or is that is that a reality for uh, Hispanics? Lots of idolatry? Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is to says that she truly believed Jesus was white. Mexicans were easily influenced by European Catholicism. This one says, I thought Jesus was exactly who the Americans portrayed him to be, just like, think, passion of the Christ. Uh, my grandmother once told me Jesus can be however you imagine him to look like. 
and for her, she imagined him as a white man with blonde, curly hair and blue eyes. This was beautiful and very pure to her. Now, she was a light-skinned woman with a dark brown, coarse, curly hair, so there was a lot of self-hatred in her thoughts, right? She always wanted straight hair, so she visualized Jesus as even who she wanted to be. Um, let's go. This one says, yes, we grew up believing Jesus was a white man. We learned him to be very passive, a very kind, loving Jesus, just like the Americans. Uh, you said it yourself. Let's see. She says, yeah, they never cared about people of color, so never thought about his color. Wow, she never actually thought about it. This is a different generation for her, too. Okay, and let's jump from um, white. You know what? I never believed he looked like that. It didn't make sense. It did, did, it did not make sense. I'm like, I never seen nobody look like that. Oh. You know what I mean? It's like, I wasn't really sure where that cartoon came from. Um, Let's see. Let's jump to another question. I hope you are enjoying this because I know it's for somebody. It is for somebody. It's very different than our usual rhythm. Um, so what type of curses bound the your father or your mother's side? What type of curses bound your Hispanic home growing up, Sister Erica? Oh, okay. I would say... There was a lot of diseases, you know, a lot of, you know, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, obesity, you know, from all, mostly it all came from unclean foods. Ah, okay. Yes. Let's see. This one says lots of, lots of whoredoms, lots and lots of whoredoms. This is, uh, it's interesting because she says um, she would daydream about herself looking white with straight hair and light eyes and imagine how loved and accepted it would be in society and peers. Can you imagine that identity development, you know, and that healing that has to take place? So for her, there was a lot of whoredoms on her father's side, drunkenness on both sides. Uh, Jezebel Ahab uh, was a big one, which is a huge step away from, you know, maybe the cultural tradition of the man being the patriarch or the woman staying at home. Because now, she says, for women, uh, it is it is very common for women to have positions in the church, like an evangelist, a deaconess. Um, my grandfather's a lay member. That's what she says. So definitely perpetuating curses because you've now changed from, um, you know, a patriarch and a loving mother at home. So now we have curses. This one says, both her father and mother side whoredoms, gays, lesbians, adultery, bestiality, liars, thieves, child abusers, physically and sexually, uh, witchcraft, drugs and alcohol, etc. There's even an ETC with that list, right? Um, and you say even disease. Our family trees would be very interesting. It's proof that all of us have been disobedient to the Most High Yah. It is proof, right? Because these things are not upon us and our children here. They're just not. And, you know, I, I talked to... um. I talked to women, I'm a dot, what does Pat say? Diverse? Digress, thank you, thank you. We're talking about diversity tonight. Digress, I'm going to digress. I talked to a lot of sisters about uh, health a lot, you know, mainly because of my faith, not just um, knowing anything about health. And um, I, I do want to encourage all of you to inquire of your creator as your physician, to not forget his role in our lives, you know, and to really build your faith in him first, I do say, you know, for me, faith without works is dead. So I practice, you know, if I'm trying to heal a certain area or do a certain thing, as I have in many times throughout my life, I try to do the works too, you know. The works also satisfies you mentally as you're trying to get an answer from him. So you're solely putting your trust in him. Um, I talked to multiple, multiple women just this week about heavy blood flow and menstruation. Um, remember naturally, if you uh, if your bowels are not moving, if your kidneys are not filtering, your uterus is going to bear the brunt. Okay, you need to pee and you need to shit. You must. Uh, your body was created to eliminate the things that go in it as well as the cells that die in it every day. So the uterus is going to shed a lot of burden. Right. What's inside the blood should be inside the stool. Okay, so that's the main, that's the natural. 
but also knowing that everything that we have going on is emotionally responding to us, you know, to us. Uh, almost always there is an emotion that you need to find that's going to heal you, you know, something that you need to repent for that's going to heal you. There must be a lot of desperation. There must be, because we carry on our lives so haughty, you know, so haughty, without without our yah, and without even knowing how much we need him. So um, I hope that gives you a little inspiration to, you know, my life, being here all these years, um, he's my option. Yeah, he's my option. He really, really is. And you'll see, you know, for some people, childbirth will test your soul. You want to cave in under pressure, and and I'm not even saying it's a cave in. I don't want to be negative because there's always the opportunity and the need um, that your husband may may lead you, but it'll test your strength and your faith. That's what I mean. It'll test your strength and your faith, no matter whether you birth at home or you need help from professionals. It'll test your mind, you know, and it'll make you more like a woman. It'll ma- it'll give you strength, you know, when you go through something like that. All right, so now, let's see. She says, my brother could not believe I was rejecting the faith that my mom taught us. My mom did not approve of me covering, okay, so she's covering her head now, and her mom did not approve of it. And my older sister feared that I was endangering the children. Okay, so she had her own children changing you know, coming from this Hispanic background, right, dropping this faith and a very tight family unit, by the way, and changing. Tell me, were there obstacles for you, Sister Erica, that your family put in front of you when it came to the faith and the truth? Or had it been so long since you had been really a part of that family because you were, um, you know, married and, and had a child by 16? Oh, most definitely. There were many obstacles, you know. Um, One of the obstacles was, you know, with me being very family-oriented and us, you know, being so tight-knit, I was forsaking my Mexican culture for another. You know, they thought, you know, oh, you're in a cult. They try to, you know, put thoughts in my my mind saying, are you sure, you know, your husband is leading you to the right direction? Are you sure he's not leading you? Are you, you know, they thought I was Muslim. They brought accusations out. They... You know, and one of the things they even, the first things coming into the truth, you know, I had to really get deliverance was from rejection because I received so much rejection from my family. You know, and in Mexican um, culture, you would say, you know, you, you really, you know, you really cared about what they, your reputation was very important. And then with me going to, you know, coming into the truth and leaving all of that, forsaking all of that, you know, and following my husband 100% and supporting him, that reputation, you know, the mind, you know, Satan really tries to put thoughts, you know, your family tries to really put thoughts like, are you really sure? Is this really the truth, you know? Um, lies, lies, you know, and you then know. your family, your you family. have your family, you have your family coming at you. Coming at you. And trying to put and that rejection to put on that you. Rejection on you. Yes, well said. Um, I'm just going through some of these as I hear you, too. This uh, particular sister said, and the question to her, too, was the same thing I just asked you. What obstacles did your family put in front of you when you came into the faith and the truth of your Hebrew heritage? Okay, so imagine this scenario. She said, my grandmother once pulled off my head covering and threw it because she believed I should not be covering my head. She would try to debate me on the Sabbath day, on why I shouldn't be following the commandments. Sound about right, huh, Tammy? She would tell me that I'm too young and beautiful to be dressing like an old lady, which would be modest apparel, all right? And she'd dress nice to get married, all right? And she was still a maiden then. She was still a virgin then. Her uncle isolated himself and his children from her and her family because he thought they fell off the deep end. When he finally comes around again, he tells me eat pork, which he was eating. I tell him no, he, in a spirit, 
Put the damn piece on my lips. <laughs> Sakina's done. She about to flip the table. My grandfather stopped him. I was very upset. I was very offended. When I was about to get married, my uncle and aunt tried to discourage me because she was getting married in the face now, you know, found the husband in the way. And they were still pushing it, okay? This is years later. Her uncle and her aunt were trying to discourage her by saying things won't work out, go to college first, have a full backup plan just in case. Have a full backup plan just in case, right? Wow, have a backup plan in case you divorce. Isn't this sad where we've gotten ourselves? They divorced soon after. Isn't that interesting? No, she, you know who she's talking about. Not her. Her aunt, her, yeah, her aunt and uncle. Yeah. Wow, yeah, I can't care for y'all's best. She says she's seven, seven years married at the time, or now. Um, she says that she wanted to emphasize, remember these are all Hispanic viewpoints I'm coming from. Hallelujah. She wanted to emphasize on women um, that were very good domestically. She did want to give that honor to to her heritage. The most Hispanic women could be very hard workers. They're raised to be well equipped in the kitchen and maintaining a home by cleaning. Very supportive of their husbands. They knew how to stay at home and, of course, were blessed to have many children. She said she'd also seen this in her mother. But she's also seen it with many other Hispanic sisters in the ministry. Okay, even prior to the faith, just due to cultural upbringing, she could see that um, that's a good stereotype about the Hispanic people. So that's that's encouraging. Uh, the men in the family can be very protective of their daughters, their sisters, their nieces, their granddaughters. That was very universal, she said. The girls can be pretty um, protected. Marriage um, before sex is stressed and expected. So marriage, marriage, marriage first, right? Marry, get married. Um, I don't know. I like that. I want to. I want to throw that support out there too. Um, white people have no culture. Are you kidding? What? What? Where? Where's? Where's the? You know, they're, they're just insecure, dominating, lack of submitting people that were um, with white fragility and superiority. Let's see. She says that she would know this. One of the obstacles that was put in front of her was that I was forsaking a Mexican culture for another culture. Okay, so coming to the faith, you're forsaking the Mexicans, they were considered. So they would ask, why would you give up your family? Why would you do that? All right, so I have a question from the audience, from the email. And y'all can ask anything if you would like. I just, there it is. All right, when you came into the faith, this is for Sister Erica Perez. When you came into the faith, did you have any challenges with turning away from your previous Hispanic culture? We talked a little bit about it, but she says, how was the conversion experience for letting go of your previous roots and embracing Yah's ways? Um, I did have challenges, you know, because that was very instilled in me, the, the Mexican roots. But when I came into the walk, when I came into the truth, I trusted my husband 100%. I knew he wouldn't, you know, way to the left to the right he was when I knew my husband loved something when I knew he was firm on something I trusted him so it wasn't so much of a heart I did have some obstacles but not enough to keep me from following my husband in the walk you know a lot of it I didn't understand I didn't know a, a lot why this or why that but I didn't question it I just trusted my husband I obeyed him to m much capa um, capability I could and all the understanding came and I, I have, I'm at the point right now I have so much peace I am so thankful most high Yah, for even putting my husband in this to lead his family and I wouldn't want it any other way hallelujah Oh, you speak really highly of your husband. I'm sure you've seen many changes in him. He's a new creature. Is there anything you can add to that statement? Yes, I've seen a change. I've seen him, me and my husband, we grew up, you know, together. I was 16, he was 18. You know, my dad took him in as a son because his whole family departed, whether, you know, moving, going to the Army, being incarcerated. We grew up, and I saw him grow from a young man into an to a teenager to a man and now a Hebrew man in the walk, in the faith, in his love. So it really does encourage, and I really 
I am so thankful that, you know, I am covered by him. Hallelujah. Yes, you can almost hear your tears of gratefulness. Another question from the audience, was there anything in your previous culture that helped you tra- tradition into the faith? Okay, so that would be, that'd be the opposite type of question. For example, uh, in the Hispanic culture, um, sex before marriage is shunned. Maybe some may dress modestly in Catholic church, et cetera, being a submissive wife. So was there like a little bit of a, a cultural understanding coming in too? You want to add to that? Um, yes, ma'am. You know, it wasn't very complicated because that was already instilled instill in me, you know, serve your husband, you know, you know, be a homemaker, take care of the children. So that wasn't too much of an obstacle for me. That wasn't too much of a, you know, a shock versus someone who never, you know, grew up in that atmosphere coming in and totally opposite. You know, it wasn't a big shock for me. Um, I did also, you know, they did teach modesty. They did teach, you know, um, you know, like you said, no sex until after marriage. So that all that was already pretty much I just jumped right in because it was very um it wasn't foreign to me. Let me go let me go to a, a dialogue that I had this week which is one of the one of the reasons why um I wanted to bring you on. Um let's see how we started. I'm going to some of my texts. Okay. This is a dialogue um, I'll just read the other sisters um, texting and not my own. This is hey, this is some of the righteous conversation that goes on in my life, you know. Um, she talked about how minorities face oppression and not just Black Americans, and that we all need to heal. She said uh, something else too that she knows, and she also, by the way, this this sister is um, very exposed to culture and not white, and she says that. Um, Hispanics have strong roots in their culture from her experience, and a lot of it is uh, still preserved. Um, This could be a different challenge compared to those who have had their heritage stripped completely from them. It would make it harder for them or create more challenges because they're leaving their Mexican culture and their people behind, okay? So similar to the question that was asked too, but she says sometimes, or that's something I do think about, and, and that it seems to be a little different. Maybe Hispanics could feel like they're betraying their culture and joining the faith. Did you ever, Sister Erica, feel uh, like you were betraying your family and and another faith when you left it behind? I did. In the early stages, yes, ma'am. It was mostly of my parents. I was very close to my mom and dad. You know, I, growing up, we were taught, you always take care of your parents no matter what. You're going to be there for them. You never leave them stayed very close. And when I came into the truth, that was one of the that was one of the obstacle I guess you would say. But yes, ma'am, I had experienced that. Okay. Um now she had also said um not comparing black versus Mexican of course, but just kinda expressing a point that she was trying to make on her text. She said, um, for the melanated people we didn't have any cultural roots or ties to divest ourselves from. So we don't have experience. But those who do come from a different culture, maybe such as Mexican or Hispanic, and their conversion process was more than likely different than ours because they had the tradition and the heritage. So she had the right thinking. Now, she says, what about uh, Naomi or... Was there any biblical representation that's encouraged you along the way, Sister Erica? Are you there? Have I lost you? Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. You're on now. Did you hear my? Did you hear my? Okay, go ahead. You cut off. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. What's going on? I, you know, we get when we get in trouble with somebody's hearing, right? Was there any biblical examples that you pulled strength from, or even just the story of Naomi? Man, you know, when I came into, when I came into, and I really, you know, poured myself into the work. A lot of I used, I studied the women of the Bible. I studied, you know, really, um, I really studied their ways. There, I didn't have one in particular. I would say Esther was main, the one of the main ones. Esther, you know, 
her her courage because with her her story I would say really encouraged me going to up to the king, going to my father, you know, letting him know I'm I'm no longer, you know, following these traditions. I'm no longer um following you, I guess you would say. I'm going with I'm going with my husband. I'm going for the righteous. I want to be set free. I don't want to be in bondage with this Mexican with the lies that were told to me. You know, all the whether it be witchcraft, you know, I don't want to be destroyed. I want to make it to the kingdom, you know. So that was one of the main characters. Esther was the one that I really was encouraged by. Hallelujah. I hope everyone was encouraged with uh, Sister Erica's interview. I'm wrapping it up. I'm going to play another song. And, Erica, please uh, make any side notes or anything else that you would like to say as a conclusion, anything that, um, you know, you and your husband have even discussed prior to the show, um, anything that – you know, give yourself a moment to go, ah, oh, I should have said that, you know, when the show's over. You're like, oh, oh I meant to say that. But give yourself a moment to think. Let's go to a, another song, and we'll be back. <laughs> contacted Erica, contact us first, call that number behind Pastor Dow, and uh, we will do what we can do in our order of things, hallelujah, to get you connected with fellowship. So, if you notice, um, we don't mind in this ministry presenting any racial discomfort to you so that you will be free, right? And we do believe in confronting issues in order to let anyone uh, be free and know how we feel and what we think and it's, it's the Hebrew faith. It's not about color. So many awesome, good videos and teachings on this type of topic. I pastored out in his channel at the at the Pastor Dow channel on YouTube. You can go all the way back many, many, many years ago. Um, I don't believe in protecting white advantage at all, and I don't believe in white superiority. I have heard stories within Israel of racial dialogues not going too well. 
And so I pray that each of us are able to talk very freely without any harsh emotions, very considerate of the plight of our people, and even just the identity development of each one of us, you know. And hopefully if it's superior, you will you will learn, hallelujah, to humble yourself. And then, of course, if it is any emotional bondage or uh, racial bondage that you've been in, I pray that you, you get some freedom. It's been nice to hear from you, Sister Erica. Give me your closing thoughts or anything that you would like to share. We'll wrap it up. Yes, ma'am. One thing that comes to my mind was the story of Miriam when she was envious of the Ethiopian woman because she was married to Moses and might have actually was from another nation. You know, whether homeborn or stranger, Yah has called all of us according to his will. You know, it's all for his glory as a witness against our natural family. It's also a testimony for the nations that Yah has even called the strangers to join from all nations. That's it. Can I get a hallelujah from my audience? Hallelujah. All right. Give a big shalom to Sister Erica. Shalom. Shalom. There you go. Thank you so much, Sister Erica. Big hugs and double honor to your husband. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for leading the saints down there and representing Straightway Ministry, okay? Hallelujah. Bless y'all. Bless you, bless you. Let's blow the shofar for the scattered Hebrews all over the world and for our Hispanic people who are just, uh, man, just as overcoming as the Hebrews. Hallelujah. Good night. Bless y'all.